Hello my friends, the topic we're going to focus on here is hydrocephalus, literally water in head. Hydrocephalus is a very important medical condition that can affect any one of us at virtually any time in life. Since when we are still a tiny fetus inside the uterus until late in our lives as a consequence of the process of aging. But to understand what hydrocephalus is, how it's treated, and what are its main complications, we have to talk a little about some details of the anatomy and the physiology of the central nervous system. Here in this drawing, we see a lateral view of the brain. This is the internal surface of the right hemisphere, and here, in darker gray, is the corpus callosum that is a bunch of fibers that connect the left hemisphere to the right one. This structure is the cerebellum and this other one is the medulla going downwards into the vertebral canal. Now, when I press this button, the ventricular system is displayed in blue. It's a set of interconnected cavities where the cerebral spinal fluid is produced and circulates in order to protect and nourish our central nervous system. Note that the lateral ventricle is the bigger one and it's connected to the third ventricle through a narrow orifice that we call foramen of Monro. The third ventricle is connected to the fourth one located just below through a short and narrow canal called aqueduct of Silvius. I wanted to note that on the inferior portion of the fourth ventricle there is a set of small orifices through which the cerebral spinal fluid can leave the ventricular system to reach the external surface of cerebellum, medulla and brain. This is going to be very important to understand the onset of hydrocephalus. Okay. What happens? A yellow arrow appears and this yellow arrow is going to show us the pathway of the liquid or cerebral spinal fluid inside the ventricles. Let's see it. The liquid is produced by glandular structures called choroid plexus that we can see here inside the lateral, the third and the fourth ventricle. This liquid is continuously produced as well as the absorption that occurs mostly along this large vein located at the top of the internal surface of the cranium. So the liquid must pass from one chamber to another until it reaches the outlet orifices located down here to finally be absorbed by that large vein. Now you can understand what will happen if there is an obstacle to the free passage of the liquid. And that's what I do when I press this button. Take a look. I created an obstacle and the liquid starts to accumulate inside the ventricular system, compressing the brain against the bones of the skull. It causes a dramatic situation that requires immediate medical intervention to prevent brain damage. And what can we do to remedy the problem? That's what we'll see now by pressing the next button. The most common neurosurgical treatment is the installation of a flexible tube or shunt that will drain the excess liquid away from the brain. Most commonly, the new place to where the liquid is sent is the abdominal cavity of the patient. Now pay attention to this detail. What you see here is a valvular mechanism that is placed in the tube to make the liquid flow only in one direction away from the brain and not backward what is responsible for a fundamental role in the relief and control of the intracranial pressure but unhappily there may be some complications with the drainage system and the most common one is the occlusion of the tube by blood clots, for example. And uh, that's what we're going to see by pressing the next button.
take a look. Here you can see that the blood clot has formed and clings to the tube. It makes the drainage of the liquid slow down until it stops completely and as a consequence of that, the liquid starts to accumulate and compresses the brain against the bones of the cranium once more. Of course, this is a very important medical event that demands for neurosurgical intervention to evaluate the problem and in most cases it's going to be necessary an immediate replacement of the defective drainage system. But I must make an important observation at this point that despite the severity of the medical condition, there are many examples of patients around the world that live a good life with their shunts without the recurrence of complications such as this one that we have just described.